Book 24 He who believes giving to be an easy matter is mistaken. It offers very great difficulties if we bestow our bounty rationally and do not scatter it impulsively and at random. I do this man a service, I requit a good turn done me by that one. I help this other because I pity him. This man, again, I teach to be no fit object for poverty to hold down or degrade. I shall not give some men anything, although they are in want, because even if I do give to them, they will still be in want. I shall proffer my bounty to some, and shall forcibly thrust it upon others. I cannot be neglecting my own interests while I am doing this. At no time do I make more people in my debt than when I am giving things away. What, you say, do you give that you may receive again? At any rate, I do not give that I may throw my bounty away. What I give should be so placed that although I cannot ask for its return, yet it may be given back to me. A benefit should be invested in the same manner as a treasure buried deep in the earth, which you would not dig up unless actually obliged. Why, what opportunities of conferring benefits the mere house of a rich man affords? For who considers generous behavior due only to those who wear the toga? Nature bids me do good to mankind. What difference does it make whether they be slaves or free men, free-born or emancipated, whether their freedom be legally acquired or bestowed by arrangement among friends? Wherever there is a human being, there is an opportunity for a benefit. Consequently, Money may be distributed even within one's own threshold, and a field may be found there for the practice of free-handedness, which is not so called because it is our duty towards free men, but because it takes its rise in a free-born mind. In the case of the wise man, this never falls upon base and unworthy recipients, and never becomes so exhausted as not, whenever it finds a worthy object, to flow as if its store was undiminished. You have, therefore, no grounds for misunderstanding the honorable, brave, and spirited language which you hear from those who are studying wisdom. And first of all, observe this, that a student of wisdom is not the same thing as a man who has made himself perfect in wisdom. The former will say to you, In my talk I express the most admirable sentiments, yet I am still weltering amid countless ills. You must not force me to act upon my rules. At the present time I am forming myself molding my character, and striving to rise myself to the height of a great example. If I should ever succeed in carrying out all that I have set myself to accomplish, you may then demand that my words and deeds should correspond. But he who has reached the summit of human perfection will deal otherwise with you, and will say, In the first place, you have no business to allow yourself to sit in judgment upon your betters. I have already obtained one proof of my righteousness in having become an object of dislike to bad men. However, to make you a rational answer, which I grudge to no man, listen to what I declare, and at what price I value all things. Riches, I say, are not a good thing, for if they were, they would make men good. Now, since that which is found even among bad men cannot be termed good, I do not allow them to be called so. Nevertheless, I admit they are desirable and useful and contribute to great comfort to our lives. Book 25 Learn, then, since we both agree that they are desirable, what my reason is amongst counting them among good things, and in what respects I should behave differently to you if I possessed them. Place me as master in the house of a very rich man. Place me where gold and silver plate is used for the commonest purposes. I shall not think more of myself because of things which even though they are in my house are yet no part of me. Take me away to the wooden bridge, and put me down there among the beggars. I shall not despise myself because I am sitting among those who hold out their hands for alms. For what can the lack of a piece of bread matter to one who does not lack the power of dying? Well, then, I prefer the magnificent house to the beggar's bridge. Place me among magnificent furniture and all the appliances of luxury. I shall not think myself any happier because my cloak is soft, because my guest rests upon purple. Change the scene. I shall be no more miserable if my weary head rests upon a bundle of hay if I lie upon a cushion from the circus, with all the stuffing on the point of coming out through its patches of threadbare cloth. Well then, I prefer, as far as my feelings go, to show myself in public, dressed in woolen and in robes of office, rather than with naked or half-covered shoulders. I should like every day's business to turn out just as I wish it to do, and new congratulations to be constantly following upon the former ones. Yet I will not pride myself upon this, Change all this good fortune for its opposite. Let my spirit be distracted by losses, grief, various kinds of attacks. 
Let no hour pass without some dispute. I shall not on this account, though beset by the greatest miseries, call myself the most miserable of beings. Nor shall I curse any particular day, for I have taken care to have no unlucky days. What then is the upshot of all this? It is that I prefer to have to regulate joys than to stifle sorrows. The great Socrates would say the same thing to you. Make me, he would say, the conqueror of all nations. Let the voluptuous car of Bacchus bear me in triumph to Thebes from the rising of the sun. Let the kings of the Persians receive laws from me, yet I shall feel myself to be a man at the very moment when all around salute me as a god. Straightway connect this lofty height with a headlong fall into misfortune. Let me be placed upon a foreign chariot that I may grace the triumph of a proud and savage conqueror. I will follow another's car with no more humility than I showed when I stood in my own. What then? In spite of all this, I had rather be a conqueror than a captive. I despise the whole dominion of fortune, but still, if I were given my choice, I would choose its better parts. I shall make whatever befalls me become a good thing, but I prefer that what befalls me should be comfortable and pleasant and unlikely to cause me annoyance. For you need not suppose that any virtue exists without labor, but some virtues need spurs, while others need the curb. As we have to check our body on a downward path, and to urge it to climb a steep one, so also the path of some virtues lead downhill, that of others uphill. Can we doubt that patience, courage, constancy, and all the other virtues which have to meet strong opposition, and to trample fortune under their feet, are climbing, struggling, winning their way up a steep ascent? Why is it not equally evident that generosity, moderation, and gentleness glide easily downhill? With the latter we must hold in our spirit, lest it run away with us. With the former we must urge and spur it on. We ought, therefore, to apply these energetic, combative virtues to poverty, and to riches those other more thrifty ones which trip lightly along, and merely support their own weight. This being the distinction between them, I would rather have to deal with those which I could practice in comparative quiet than those of which one can only make trial through blood and sweat. Wherefore, says the sage, I do not talk one way and live another, but you do not rightly understand what I say. The sound of my words alone reaches your ears. You do not try to find out their meaning. Book 26 What difference, then, is there between me, who am a fool, and you, who are a wise man? All the difference in the world, for riches are slaves in the house of a wise man, but masters in that of a fool. You accustom yourself to them and cling to them, as if somebody had promised that they should be yours forever. But a wise man never thinks so much about poverty as when he is surrounded by riches. No general ever trusts so implicitly is the maintenance of peace as not to make himself ready for a war, which, though it may not actually be waged, has nevertheless been declared. You are rendered overproud by a fine house, as though it could never burn or fall down, and your heads are turned by riches as though they were beyond the reach of all dangers, and were so great that fortune has not sufficient strength to swallow them up. You sit idly playing with your wealth, and do not foresee the perils in store for it, as savages generally do when besieged. For, not understanding the use of siege artillery, they look on idly at the labors of the besiegers, and do not understand that the object of the machines which they are putting together at a distance, and this is exactly what happens to you. You go to sleep over your property, and never reflect how many misfortunes loom menacingly around you on all sides, and soon will plunder you of all spoils. But if one takes away riches from the wise man, one leaves him still in possession of all that is his, for he lives happy in the present and without fear of the future. The great Socrates, or anyone else who had the same superiority to and power to withstand the things of his life, would say, I have no more fixed principle than that of not altering the course of my life to suit your prejudices. You may pour your accustomed talk upon me from all sides. I shall not think that you are abusing me, but that you are merely wailing like poor little babies. This is what the man will say who possesses wisdom, whose mind, being free from vices, bids him reproach others, not because he hates them, but in order to improve them, and to this he will add, Your opinion of me affects me with pain not for my own sake, but for yours, because to hate perfection and to assail virtue is in itself a resignation of all hope of doing well. You do me no harm, neither do men harm the gods when they overthrow their altars, 
but it is clear that your intention is an evil one, and that you will wish to do harm, even where you are not able. I bear with your prating in the same spirit in which Jupiter, best and greatest, bears with the idle tales of the poets, one of whom represents him with wings, another with horns, another as an adulterer staying out all night, another as dealing harshly with the gods, another as unjust to men, another as the seducer of noble youths whom he carries off by force, and those, too, his own relatives, another as a parricide, and the conqueror of another's kingdom, and that his father's. The only result of such tales is that men feel less shame at committing sin if they believe the gods to be guilty of such actions. But although this conduct of yours does not hurt me, yet for your own sakes I advise you, respect virtue. Believe those who, having long followed her, cry aloud that what they follow is a thing of might, and daily appears mightier. Reverence her as you would the gods, and reverence her followers as you would the priests of the gods. And whenever any mention of sacred writings is made, Favete liguis, favor us with silence. This word is not derived, as most people imagine, from favor, but commands silence, that divine service may be performed without being interrupted by any words of evil omen. It is much more necessary that you should be ordered to do this, in order that whatever utterance is made by that oracle, you may listen to it with attention and in silence. Whenever anyone beats a sistrum, pretending to do so by divine command, any proficient in grazing his own skin covers his arms and shoulders with blood from light cuts. Any one crawls on his knees howling along the street, or any old man clad in linen comes forth in daylight with a lamp and laurel branch and cries out that one of the gods is angry. You crowd around him and listen to his words, and each increases the other's wonderment by declaring him to be divinely inspired. Book 27 Behold! From that prison of his, which by entering he cleansed from shame and rendered more honorable than any senate house, Socrates addresses you, saying, What is this madness of yours? What is this disposition, at war alike with gods and men, which leads you to calumniate virtue and to outrage holiness with malicious accusations? Praise good men if you are able. If not, pass them by in silence. If indeed you take pleasure in this offensive abusiveness, fall foul of one another. For when you rave against heaven, I do not say that you commit sacrilege, but you waste your time. I once afforded Aristophanes with the subject of a jest. Since then, all the crew of comic poets have made me a mark for their envenomed wit. My virtue has been made to shine more brightly by the very blows which have been aimed at it. For it is to its advantage to be brought before the public and exposed to temptation. Nor do any people understand its greatness more than those who by their assaults have made trial of its strength. The hardness of flint is known to none so well as those who strike it. I offer myself to all attacks, like some lonely rock in a shallow sea, which the waves never cease to beat upon from whatever quarter they may come, but which they cannot thereby move from its place, nor yet wear away, for however many years they may unceasingly dash against it. Bound upon me, rush upon me, I will overcome you by enduring your onset. Whatever strikes against that which is firm and unconquerable merely injures itself by its own violence." Wherefore, seek some soft and yielding object to pierce with your darts. But have you leisure to peer into other men's evil deeds and to sit in judgment upon anybody? To ask how it is that this philosopher has so roomy a house, or that one so good a dinner? Do you look at other people's pimples while you yourselves are covered with countless ulcers? This is as though one who was eaten up by the mange were to point with scorn at the moles and warts on the bodies of the handsomest men. Reproach Plato without having sought for money, Reproach Aristotle without having obtained it, Democritus with having disregarded it, Epicurus with having spent it, cast Phaedrus and Alcibiades in my own teeth, you who reach the height of enjoyment whenever you get an opportunity of imitating our vices. Why do you not rather cast your eyes around yourself at the ills which tear you to pieces on every side, some attacking you from without, some burning in your own bosoms? However little you know your own place, Mankind has not yet come to such a pass that you can have leisure to wag your tongues to the reproach of your betters. Book 28 This you do not understand, and you bear a countenance which does not befit your condition. Like many men who sit in the circus or the theater without having learned that their home is already in mourning. But I, looking forward from my lofty standpoint, can see what storms are either threatening you, and will burst in torrents upon you somewhat later, 
or are close upon you and on the point of sweeping away all that you possess. Why, though you are hardly aware of it, is there not a whirling hurricane at this moment spinning round and confusing your minds, making them seek and avoid the very same things, now raising them aloft and now dashing them below? The End Thank you for listening to this audiobook in progress. To hear more of our audiobooks in progress, please subscribe to this channel and like our videos. All of our completed audiobooks can be downloaded for free at copyleftaudiobooks.com. Thank you for listening and for your support.